Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we wake our way through this wonderful book of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 9. So Paul is continuing to answer questions from a letter that was written to, from, or to him from the church at Corinth, where he in chapter 8 addressed the issue of knowledge, of their rights and liberties in Christ, and how it is to be governed by love. Because apart from love, knowledge puffs up or becomes self-serving and therefore turns into pride. This was occurring in the church of Corinth, and it was dealing with the eating of things offered to idols, which was the meat of the animals that were sacrificed to the pagan gods. Paul explains to them, he says in last chapter, he says, we know that all we all have knowledge. We know that we all have knowledge. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other god but one. And what was happening in the church of Corinth was you had Christians who had knowledge concerning their rights and liberties, knowing that there is only one true God and that idols are nothing. Therefore, they would go and buy the cheap meat that was offered to idols and they would eat it. Because as they would go into the market to buy their daily meats, on one side you would have the meats that were raised by the farmers. On the other side, you would have the meats that were sold cheaper to the market you know, for to, to sell, and it was cheap meat. And the same meat, but offered to idols. And so, you know, these people, they would eat it, and it would not defile their conscience because they knew what their rights and their freedoms were in Christ. They did not stumble over it because they understood that this meat was not affected by the idols. So to them, it's a green light, which they are right. It's okay. But then you had other Christians who were weak in their understanding of their liberties and rights. And for the sake of their conscience, they would rather spend more money on the meat that was raised by the farmer rather than spending it on the money that was offered to false gods. These were the weaker brethren, you know, who if they ate the meat, they would be defiling their conscience. For them, that's a red light. So Paul says to the stronger brother, be careful that your knowledge does not become self-serving and prideful. Just because you understand your liberties, your rights, and freedoms in Christ does not mean you can be insensitive to the conscience of others. Rather, you are to exercise your knowledge through love. If you know someone who is weak, don't go buying that meat in front of them. Don't try to take the place also of the Holy Spirit and try to convince them of your convictions that you are doing what is right, that you both have the liberty to do so. Don't do that. Whatever you do, Think of the effect it may have on others in order to not cause your brother to stumble or fall. So Paul tells him, hey, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Love edifies. Love builds up and strengthens one another. And this should be at the forefront of our hearts because if we walk strictly in knowledge and without love, Paul says you may have the knowledge, but you don't know anything about the Lord. Or his heart. Jesus loves first, and we are to submit to his authority. And when he says to love one another as I have loved you, we need to understand that he loved by loving first. We are to love others as he did, first to edify our brothers and sisters. Paul, understanding the value of each person in the body of Christ, he declared in chapter 8, verse 13, he says, Therefore, Look, when they're talking about foods, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat it, lest I make my brother stumble. So if I, you know, if I know and understand that, you know, my liberties and my rights, not saying that it's bad, he says, use wisdom by, by laying them down for the weaker brother. Use wisdom to just put yourself aside for, for the the sake of the weaker brother. Don't cause that person to stumble. Do what's best for others. Because people are what's important to God, not your individual rights. Now concerning rights, Paul is continuing on on this theme and shares with them from his own life how he had to lay aside certain rights. And he had 
you know, even as an apostle, he had to lay a lot of rights down for what was best for others. Maybe not what was best or easiest for him, but what was best for others that he was ministering to. So we begin on 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where in the original letter, there's... So we're continuing on that theme into chapter 9. Asks, Am I not an apostle? Paul is now going to establish his right as an apostle. Now, we've even seen, we've seen in Acts now, when Paul lays out a case, it's like within his mind, he finds himself automatically in this courtroom, right? And I would say I would never want to be on the opposite side of Paul in a courtroom. And the reason he begins to build a case is found in verse 3. Look at verse 3. He says, my defense to those who examine me is this. So here is what Paul is dealing with right now. Now, there's a group of leadership in the church at Corinth that came in after he left and were threatened by his position over the church, his apostleship. They wanted all the power and the authority over their church. So this group began to uh, question Paul's authority, sort of bad-mouthing him and opposing his position in the church. And while doing that, they were not supporting him materially or financially at all. They were just not supporting him whatsoever, like with food or financially, supporting him or his ministry. This is why Paul will establish his, you know, right as an apostle first, and how an apostle is to be financially supported by the church. So Paul, with this mindset, says, okay, if you're trying to lay your case down and examine me as if I'm on trial, then allow me in my defense the same freedom to examine you. By calling my own witnesses to the witness stand, and Paul was very good and notorious for doing that. He always had someone that uh, his witnesses, because to establish a fact in that culture, you needed two witnesses. So he, uh, he calls up his, he's going to be calling his witnesses to the stand. And one of their accusations that the leaders were saying was that Paul was not one of the 12. And therefore, he was not a genuine apostle. Therefore, he does not even deserve our support materially or financially. Totally disregarding the fact that Paul was used by God to plant the church in Corinth and poured out into that church for 18 months, establishing them, building a solid foundation on Jesus Christ and spent a lot of valuable time there, second to Ephesus, where he spent three years. But here, they were trying to lay their case that Paul is not an apostle. He was not of the twelve therefore does not deserve the support of the church. So Paul in chapter 9, like I said, he's going to establish his rights as an apostle, and that apostle is to be supported financially and materially by the church. And even though Paul will prove his case because he's going to make his case and he will be right, right? Like surprise there, right? He's going to be right. But that's not what he's aiming for. It's not what he's aiming for. He will establish his rights only to tell him that he had to lay those rights aside. He had to lay those for the sake of the more important things. Just as he taught in chapter 7, Paul addressed the church at Corinth to tell him, hey, you need to lay aside your rights for the sake of the weaker brother. That food was not that important, you know, to stumble a brother. It wasn't that important. Paul is saying, I'm not just telling you to give up your rights for more important things, but I am going to show you and demonstrate to you through my life how to lay aside things. He's, he's not going up there, do as I say, not as I do. He's going to say, look at me as I do and listen to what I say. So Paul begins verse 1 by asking, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord, which was a requirement in the early church to be an apostle? was to have seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that Paul did see Jesus in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus when his conversion took place. Then Paul asks, are you not my work in the Lord? Here Paul established the fact, okay, he's an apostle. Not of the original 12, but an apostle by conversion where the Lord Jesus commissioned him on the Damascus road. And what was the evidence of this, that he was an apostle? Paul went out. And he preached the gospel and established churches, all, all that he visited in his first, second, and even third missionary journey. And one of them just happens to be the church in Corinth. 
Paul points them to the facts by asking, are you not my work in the Lord? Basically saying, am I not the reason that you guys know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or that there is a church in Corinth? Or that there is leadership that was raised up in the church? All this evidence was enough. That God had called me to be an apostle and to serve him with my life, establishing you as a church. Verse 2, if I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Paul is saying, look, I understand if other places are debating my apostleship. However, I can't wrap my mind around this debating in Corinth. Because you yourselves are my vindication. You yourselves are the seal to the fact that I was called to the Lord to be an apostle. Because that church existed. In verse 3, he says, my defense to those who examine me is this. He said, do we have no right to eat and drink? It's a good question. As an apostle, do we have a right to eat and drink for our daily needs? And that are to be met by the church. As we have given our lives to serve you full time in the ministry, working countless hours and establishing God's kingdom. Paul asks, do we have a right to be given our daily needs as an apostle? Well, hold your place in 1 Corinthians. And if you can please turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to begin Matthew chapter 10, starting with verse 5. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor cop copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff. And here's his point. For a worker is worthy of his food. So Paul first, you know, his first right to receive his support was the fact that he was an apostle. And as an apostle, we have a right to be supported by the church according to the words of the Lord, for a worker is worthy of his food. Paul then asks, verse 5, do we have no right to tank along a believing wife? Not only is the church support, supposed to support the apostle, but if they had their wife with them, the church is supposed to support them both, as do also other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas, that is Peter. Peter was married, and apparently Peter would take his wife with him, and they, along with other apostles, would be supported by the church of Corinth. But they were denying support to the apostle Paul. It's very sad. It's very sad. And hard to kind of wrap my own mind around this as I'm reading this. Verse 6, he says, Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So what, what Paul means here is, in this verse, kind of takes us back to, you know, Acts, the book of Acts. When Paul and Barnabas, they went out on their missionary journey to go out and preach the gospel wherever they went, they supported themselves by being tent makers. They, they supported themselves to meet the needs that they needed just to survive, to food, you know, for food and shelter or whatever the case may be. So they would work in their job during the day to meet their needs but on the other time that they weren't working, they were out ministering to people and establishing churches. And I've also have read that Paul only took what he needed from his money. He only took what he needed and he gave the rest of his money to those in need. All he cared was just, just to get through the day. And that, that's pretty amazing. Yet when the other apostles came to Corinth, the church, they had no problem supporting them. But it seems that with Paul, they just uh, was help, you know, holding things back from him. Now, if you look at verses 4, 5, and 6, <clears throat> Paul asks, verse 4, 
do we have no right? Verse 5, do we have no right? Verse 6, or is it Barnabas and I who have no right? This is about rights, right, as an apostle. So he's establishing that he does have the right as an apostle, using the example of the other apostles. But now, here, he's going to start to turn around to human experience, something that they would all be familiar with. And he calls the everyday worker to the witness stand to testify that a worker ought to be supported in the work that they are doing. And so Paul asks, verse 7, who ever goes to war at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its own fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Paul is saying, hey, take a look around you. Do people go to work to the point that they are completely worn out and are not supported by their work? Is that what you see? He's like, no. The answer is no, they don't. And they understood that. That after a work period of many hours in the workday, a worker is always supported by their work. So Paul brings the soldier to the stand that, you know, to say that they are supported, the, the farmer to the stand to say that they are supported, and the rancher to the stand to say that they are supported. All three know that after their hard work, they know with confidence that they will be supported and understood that there is a reward for all their hard work. Paul is like, when a person works and labors as much in spiritual settings and not much in the physical settings, is that person not do their right of being rewarded for their hard work? In other words, if they accepted this principle with the soldiers and the farmers and the ranchers, why did they, you know, why was it so hard for them to accept this with those who God has called to give their lives to be spiritual leaders in the church or to be an apostle. This should have never been a question with the church, but something that they should have readily taken care of. I mean, just right off the bat, oh, the apostle Paul's coming. Let's, let's make things ready for him and make him comfortable. That would have been the heart. You know, after uh, retiring from a long career in the U.S. Navy, I can look back and I think of all the things that I have done and accomplished. Just by looking at a shadow box, that's what makes it easy. I have a shadow box in my office that was presented to me on, the, on my day of retirement. I can remember just about everything that I did just by looking at the ribbons or the awards that I received or the medals that I was given because of the hard work and hours that were put into it. I can remember deployments with certain ribbons saying, you know, hey, you've been out to sea this many times. I can remember those deployments. I can remember the bases that I served, the rank that I've made it, and the stripes that I've earned for every four years that I've served of good conduct. It's a lot of hard work. I can see it all in one shadow box. And I have something to show for my career. Every day I had something to show for the work that I did serving my country. But I will say, when the Lord called me into his ministry, I have never worked so hard in my entire life than I have in these last couple of years. Where at the end of the day, I had nothing to show for the work that was done. Ministry takes time, weeks, months, because ministry involves working with people. But when I look back at the last two years of what the Lord has done, I can see clearly what God has done and God reveals to me who he is in those two years. My reward is that I get to grow strong in him, in faith, in closeness and in confidence in him. And I will not change a thing, so I'm not complaining, y'all. <laughs> but I know of a lot of brothers who are pastors who work a day job to provide for their families and work full-time ministry because ministry is full-time. And when I see all the work that they do, being bivocational, I look at myself and I say, you know what? I have no excuse for doing anything less. I've been asked quite often, being as a, as a new pastor, as a new plant here, why do I teach twice a week? And not just on Sundays as people starting out would typically do. I tell them it's because God has given me the provision financially not to be bivocational, and he's given me the time to be able to do what these hardworking pastors are doing while they are working, you know, by vocational. So I give myself no excuse to put in the same effort. 
God has led the way. And if he calls me to teach, and that's the most important, if he calls me to teach twice a week, then guess what? I will obey his call. And I do so with a heart of thanksgiving for what God has given me. All to say, ministry is hard work and requires a lot of time, not only to put into it, but also to see the fruit of the work being done. And what's sad is that the church at Corinth was not supporting the Apostle Paul in his, in his hard work. And we know that he was a hard working man. Paul never stood still. He was always ready to go and go and go. But not to support him in his hard work, that alone makes it hard for the ministry and becomes harder on the minister. But on top of that, when there is no appreciation being shown by the people who received what they have received from the Apostle Paul, we're not esteeming their spiritual things as valuable, especially not valuable enough to give just a little bit to meet his needs, is extremely, extremely hard on top of it all. And this is a struggle and a reality that many go through in their calling and has made it harder in their calling when it's not understood by the church clearly that you are supposed to back these folks that are spending their time serving the Lord with their lives. Paul says, listen, everywhere you look in your human experience, try to understand that what you're doing to me is something you would never do to anyone who labors hard in the physical, whether a soldier, farmer, or rancher. You would never do to them what you are doing to me and to those who are working just as hard for the spiritual things in people's lives. And then Paul now brings forth the scriptures to the stand to testify. And these scriptures will testify God's heart about all this. Verse 8, he says, do I say th these things as a mere man? Is this just my opinion about all this? Or does the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. Paul is saying from the Old Testament that God says a person is not allowed to work an animal to death without feeding it. So how is it that you're working the Apostle Paul and Bartimus to death without feeding them? And notice the three words in verse 10, plows, threshes, and most importantly, partaker that whoever plows or threshes in hope should be a partaker of this hope, of the fruit that comes out of it. And I say amen to that. It's well-deserved. Say amen to that. So I'll be doing an offering after service. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. Verse 11. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? And what Paul is saying is that, you know, look, I've given my life for your spiritual growth, your spiritual health, teaching you the precious spiritual truths. I mean, I mean, for us, I mean, really, think about that. Can you imagine a church where the Apostle Paul is teaching? Where they're just sitting there, you know, receiving the richness of the teaching of his word. And Paul did this for 18 months. He labored for them for 18 months. Man, I can imagine. It would be such a huge blessing. I would be, I'd probably be sitting right here just looking up listening. It would just be amazing. But when I think about how the church of Corinth was, was treating him, it floors me. How unthankful that church could be that they wouldn't even buy him a meal at El Rancho Grande. I can say I'm truly blessed. I'm truly blessed. <laughs> it's mind-blowing. But also... Think about how the church must have felt when the church was hearing this letter being read to the church. I'm sure they had to feel ashamed. I, at least I hope, but I'm sure the entire church, as they're listening to us, that they had to be ashamed of themselves. But just by the sheer shame, I believe it would cause them to examine their hearts. I mean, I have to think this. I have to believe this. And did you notice Paul posed the question, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Well, apparently, it was a great thing to them. When a person looks at supporting 
uh, the material needs of those who God has called to give their uh, lives to ministry, whether it being 40 hours a week or 60, whatever it accumulates to, all that time to the minister, you know, to minister to the body of Christ. When a person looks at supporting them with material uh, needs, um, they look, and if they're looking at it as a great thing to support them, then that's a true reflection of that person. And well, here's what they're reflecting, that they value material things more importantly than the spiritual things. And they have zero conscience of what is truly valuable in life. They believe in their mind, not so much, you know, what, what was really valuable were the material things, not so much the, the, the spiritual things. They say, if you want to know what is more important to you, if you want to find out what's more important to you, then look at what your time and money is spent on and what's given to you. The church would have rather found another apostle at this point who was either wouldn't have any expectations of anything or who was really cheap. That's, that's just, it's just sad. So he asked, is it a big thing that we re reap, you know, your material things? Well, the evidence shows that it was. And Paul says, because he knew this, nevertheless, verse 12, we have not used this right. Notice the word right again. But endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So again, apparently the church at Corinth was out there supporting other ministries, but not supporting Paul. And he's saying, look, we never used that right for you to support us. And here Paul gives us the reason why, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. They have forsaken their right to be supported by that church. They would, that would probably make a big deal out of it, if, even if they gave him just a little bit. But he would not, he would surrender their right, he would not exercise it, for the sake that it would hinder the work of the gospel of Christ in that church. And that's, again, it's sad. Paul was willing to lay it aside himself, letting it go for the more important things. Now, Paul brings his fourth you know, witness to testify and asks in verse 13, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Now he's talking about the Levites who were the priests in the Old Testament. When the offerings were brought to be sacrificed, portions would be given to the Levites and the priests because God called them to give their lives into the spiritual service. So even under the law seen through the Levites, God made it known that they are to be supported and taken care of in their work, in the physical and material way. And here is a beautiful image that, you know, these scriptures are given. It says, when the people brought their offering to the Levite priest, God declared to them in the book of Numbers that you were bringing your offerings to me. It wasn't about giving it to anybody else or, oh, we're giving it to the Levites or nothing. No, when you're bringing your offering, you are giving it to God. And once, this is God, and once you've given them to me, I will give a portion to those who are serving me because this is my heart towards them. Paul is letting them know this is how God has always been in history. Now to close his case concerning their rights, Paul brings our Lord Jesus Christ to the stand and says, verse 14, Even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And if you don't have this in your notes, Paul is referring to Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. Jesus had said these same things when he sent out the 12, but here Jesus is sending 70 out to preach the gospel in, in Israel. And Jesus said in verse 5, he says, But who, whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it'll return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. So here is Jesus himself. He's bringing clarity to it all, that the laborer is to be supported for their work, for they are worthy of their wages. And so Paul, he closes his case, having clearly established 
his right to be financially, uh, materially supported for what he has been called to do by the Lord. But now he will point out three reasons why he did not demand his rights. It says in verse 15, But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done to me. Saying, I've, you know, I've written these things to you, and I'm, but I'm not hinting to you that I want you to support me. As a matter of fact, look what Paul says right after. He says, For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. Basically saying, hey, I'd, it would be better for me to die than to take one cent from you, knowing that it was a big thing for you. We're talking about a church that was prospering so well being blessed by all these material things, financially they were just peaking and yet wouldn't sow into his ministry. Can you imagine the reward that they missed out on? Paul was, Paul was like, if you offered me now a penny, I wouldn't take it from you. And rob him of his boasting. That's interesting that he says that, rob him of his boasting, which was meant, or what he meant was that he ministered willingly and freely from his heart. He was not in the ministry for money. He was not in it for other th those things at all. Paul preached the gospel and lived by the gospel. Now let me ask you this, was Paul wealthy? Not at all. Paul was poor, but God took care of him through the support from the churches at like Philippi and, and other churches. But Paul knew he was rich in one way, and it was this that they could never accuse him of being in the ministry for the sake of money. It was not about that for him, which I'm sure they would accuse him if he accepted one penny. So Paul says, hey, look, I would rather die than take a cent from you right now, just for how small you think of me and the calling that I have upon my life. And I got to thinking, you know, this was a relationship that should have looked like the relationship that he had with the church at Philippi. Paul had written that letter to the, to the Philippians, and it was a beautiful, intimate letter of how thankful he was for them, for all that they had done for him, all the support they had given him. But it wasn't like that with the church of Corinth. We, this morning, as we're, we're going through chapter 9, should have been reading about how the, the church had poured into his life and his ministry, blessing him through the blessings that he re they received. We should have seen Paul's heart of thankfulness for their support and love for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. And Paul reporting all that would happen through his ministry, like, church, thanks to you, this is what we've been able to do because of you. We were able to establish another church, get food to this poor town where many had received Christ as their Savior because of your faithfulness of giving into the kingdom. But no, that didn't happen. And what they don't see is not only is this Rob Paul, uh, yeah, Rob Paul, but they have robbed themselves from a beautiful relationship that they could have been in and it should have been in. And think about all the blessings they missed out on. It's sad. Verse 16, he says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So Paul is laying out his reason why he continues preaching the gospel. Although now he's kind of being tested by the church at Corinth, but no one could accuse him of being in it for the money when he's being tested here. Paul says, the reason I preach the gospel is for necessity. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. On the road to Damascus, Jesus Christ had commissioned Paul to preach the gospel, and it burned within him like fire in his bones. It was a necessity for Paul. He goes, I must preach the gospel everywhere he went. And he would preach the gospel if no one supported him at all. And his life is already a testimony of that truth. He's being tested here by the church of Corinth, but his life stands the test. Paul says in verse 17, For I do this willingly. I have a reward. But if against my will I have been entrusted with a stewardship, which means Paul is saying, I'm doing this to be faithful for the stewardship God has given me. It does not matter what man says, I'm doing this to be faithful to God. What is my reward then, verse 18, that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. 
that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. This is the way Paul says, I do it this way. No one uh, may accuse me or charge me uh, for serving the Lord for money. And here are the three reasons that he laid aside his rights. Verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win with more. And to the Jews I became a Jew, that I might win Jews to those who are under the law, as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. Win is a good word. Win is a good word, amen? Verse 21, it says, Those who are without law, speaking of the Gentiles, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. Verse 22, to the weak, speaking of those who had weak consciences, I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all these things to all men that I might by all means, and here's the most important word, save some. All that he might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. And here was, we see Paul's motivation why he laid down his rights. To win, to win, to win, to save. To save. Paul breaks this all down to him. And he says is that there is not a liberty nor a right that he would not lay aside to win and see a person saved. To see a person turn to Jesus to be forgiven. To see the weight of of condemnation removed from their shoulders and watched them go from dark to light into his grace. But that was more, more valuable and important to Paul than anything else. He valued the salvation of every soul. And anyone who views their rights and liberties as the supreme thing in their life would never be able to write verses 19 through 23. They would, their pen would probably fall forward. Their rights and liberties are more important to them. So Paul, Paul is declaring in this chapter that it's not about your rights. It's about people getting saved for God's kingdom. You know, Paul did not get saved and begin serving the Lord just to get in these fights with Christians over their rights. He was like, you know, I'm turning away from these nonsense things, you know, and I'm giving my life to the most important things in this world. It's winning people for Christ and that they may be saved. He would give up any right and liberty for this period. Now, I will say everything that Paul has said and has demonstrated through his life required a lot of self-denial. Never did he once look to himself as a person with rights, rights to defend himself, rights to say, oh, wait a minute, what about me? You're not taking, he never did that. It may look like as if Paul was defending himself through chapter 9, but he wasn't. He was taking time to teach them the truth of God's word while his life was an example for them to see. Did you guys see that? He laid down his rights. He didn't react in the flesh. He recognized that his old nature was dead, and boy, do we need to recognize that in our own lives every day. Did you guys ever know that a dead man has no rights? You ever heard that? I'll say it again, a dead man or woman has no rights because they, there's nothing to defend. They're dead, right? Self-denial, you know, when we are to reckon ourselves dead, in, you know, to ourselves and alive in Christ, self-denial becomes a full reliance on our Lord Jesus Christ. A dead man cannot defend themselves. I haven't ever seen that. I don't know about y'all, but I haven't ever seen that. But if we are dead to self and alive in Christ, do we act or should we act as if we have our own rights? As if we're so important? That, that, that is like the opposite of self-denial. So my question to you this morning is, how much self-denial is happening in your relationship with the Lord? As we look at Paul's life, he understood that his life was not his own. It wasn't about the Apostle Paul. It was about others coming to Christ to win, win, win. And that for him to live is Christ. 
He understood that he had been crucified in, with Christ. It was no longer him who lives, but Christ who lives in him. Self-denial is about saying yes to God every day, all day, throughout the day. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You are my God. I am your servant. And it requires our hearts to be in that posture constantly. Following Jesus is an everyday thing. It's a daily thing, right? Listening to him is an everyday thing. It's a daily thing. And once you have laid down your rights to serve the Lord, that's when your walk begins to move forward. That's when you can walk. That's when you can be led. And that's when you're listening and looking for his direction. But it requires that that self-denial every morning, that Luke 9.23, to be lived out in your lives every morning. Nothing is more important than to surrender to Jesus and to be used by Jesus to win others into his kingdom. But it starts with you and your relationship with him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you.